Welcome everybody to my episode 3 review of Star Trek Picard, The End is the Beginning. Well, we move on to episode 3 of Picard, and it starts off with a flashback, as uh, some of the episodes have done. And we're flashing back to 14 years ago on Earth, Starfleet Headquarters, and Picard has just seen the officials in Starfleet, has gone over his plan to... Do what they can do to rescue the Romulans. Uh, you know, he said that, uh, well, uh, they said they didn't, didn't have enough uh, ships. They said, well, we can take the ships out of mothballs, which means, uh, explains why we're seeing some older ships. But uh, they don't want to hear it. Uh, they don't like his plan. They obviously don't want to go with his plan. And he meets Rafi, his second command, and tells her that Starfleet has decided not to go with his idea that he couldn't convince them, and as a last-ditch last effort, uh, offered to tend his resignation, thinking that they never would accept it, uh, but they did. He says uh, that uh, he never believed in his entire life that Starfleet would become so uh, insolent and uh, intolerant, and... Uh, he couldn't, you know, he, he was sitting there in stunned silence. It's a good scene. It's a setting the stage for the interaction between Raffi and Picard later on in the episode. The thing I really don't like about this scene, though, and, and it'll go on later on, and is that Raffi's character right now is not redeemable at all. Uh, you know, she starts off very concerned about Picard and then ends up, you know, thinking about her own career. That, you know, he has dragged her down uh, to being fired because she's getting a call here from the CNC in the scene to come in and, and, and talk. And we learn later in the episode that she's been uh, uh, basically fired from Starfleet, that her security clearance is revoked, and uh, that's it. She's done. And we also find out later in the episode that she uh, has a theory about the Talshiar being on Earth and that several members of Starfleet might be involved. So you're getting, getting the idea that, you know, these people are heavily involved and they lead to, you know, getting rid of Picard and his second command. As I said, I like uh, this interaction between these two. I do like this setup scene, but I don't really like where it goes with, with Raffi. So she storms off and we uh, jump ahead to present day. And Vasquez rocks. And if this looks familiar to you, it's because uh, this is where they filmed the classic scene uh, between Kirk and the Gorn, where he fights the Gorn in the arena. <laughs> I, I don't know why they would, you know, set this other than having this as a little Easter egg uh, to the fans. Uh, it didn't really need to be set here. And Rafi is living Jim Rockford style in uh, what looks like a uh, RV storage container. And, of course, uh, she's none too happy to see Picard. Once again, this kind of sets me... The, the tone of this is, is all kind of wrong for Star Trek because Star Trek has always set up in past episodes in the movies that, you know, these people don't live on money, that, you know, they have a credit system, but they live for the advancement of humanity. And, and that, that, you know, show Raffi in the state basically because she's, you know, got fired from Starfleet. She even calls her place a Hubble. I just don't feel that this is, you know, what would be happening in, in the 24th century. But nevertheless, um, you know, this scene goes on to really reinforce that, you know, in my opinion, Rafi has, you know, taken everything that all the, all the injustices he's gotten from Starfleet and really internalized it and has become a broken person. The other thing I like about the scene is obviously it's, it was it was stated you know in the in the Bible for the series that this character would be a, a flawed character who would either be an alcoholic or a drug user and of course it is shown here that she's growing and uh, smoking something almost looks like looks like crystal meth <laughs> in a vape pipe and once again this is this goes totally contrary to what we've seen in Star Trek now I can understand people would be broken. But Gene Roddenberry's vision would be that, you know, we'd be beyond all this. Uh, but he, she, she is somebody that's addicted. She blames Picard, uh, rightly so, for really not even checking on her in 14 years. And you really can't blame her for that. And uh, Picard has come here wanting something from her, not really to check up on how she's doing. 
And you can see his internal struggle here that uh, when she really comes at him and, and, and says that she, she'd like them, you know, just like him to leave. Now, this episode is really set in, in, in a couple of spaces. We're seeing Picard's um, dealing with Rafi on Earth, and the other part of this episode is set on the board cube. And here we find uh, an old friend that really, unless you're a real big Star Trek fan and have watched The Next Generation, you're not really going to know who this character is. His name is mentioned once in the episode, but it really isn't uh, highlighted. This is Hugh. He was a... Uh, a Borg that Picard and crew rescued and tried to help in the episodes I Borg and then later on in the episodes, two part episodes of Descent. And it was Picard's plan originally in the I Borg episode to, um, to send back Hugh as a weapon, you know, to insert a virus into his programming that would infect and in essence destroy the entire Borg race. And Picard. Uh, doesn't go through with that plan because in essence he's genociding the entire Borg species. You can argue that didn't make a whole lot of sense because the Borg uh, it was a massive threat to the universe and you know whether you argue with that plan or not that's basically where, where Hugh, Hugh comes from. So now we see Hugh as really the leader of whatever they're doing here. It's not really spelled out. It's a reclamation project as far as we know so far. They're looking to reclaim a former Borg for some reason, but we don't know why. And Hugh is in charge of this, even over the, the Vulcan, uh, I mean the Romulan that's in charge that's working with um, Soji. So, so Soji meets with Hugh and they have discussions about, you know, what's been going on. And there's a group of Romulans uh, that are the only known Romulans that were assimilated by the Borg Collective. And they're on this cube in, in what is, you know, literally like a uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest uh, insane asylum type thing. Uh, so da, uh, Soji's been trying to meet with the members of this ex-Borg collective, Romulan collective, to try to, uh, you know, fathom out some more of the history and some more of the ideas behind this cube. And Hugh allows this to happen. Back on Earth... We get more scenes between uh, Rafi and Picard, and after some coaxing, uh, she decides to help him and has a name for a pilot for Picard to meet with, but then she asks him to leave. We shoot back over to the Dayston Institute in Okinawa, where we meet uh, the doctor that's going to be working with Picard. And... Another scene I don't really like here, uh, we see once again the Vulcan Commodore that is more or less the villain of the piece. Well, nothing speaks more like a villain than sunglasses. Uh, <laughs> really obvious scene here, and very distracting. I mean, in the 24th century, one, they wouldn't really be wearing glasses. We, we found out in uh, the Star Trek movies that glasses were kind of quaint. McCoy presents glasses to Kirk uh, when when... People can be treated for uh, vision problems, and glasses are really unnecessary. Furthermore, Vulcans are known to have an, an eyelid. Uh, in the original series episode, uh, an Operation Annihilate, Spock is blinded short-term by uh, light that's meant to destroy the aliens in the episode. But we find out that the Vulcan race, because they come from a hot, arid, very bright planet Vulcan, have adapted an inner eyelid that prevents them from having any kind of eye problems. So why the doctor, who's supposedly a Vulcan, although I secretly think she's a Romulan here, so it might make sense, would be uh, wearing sunglasses when the human scientist uh, doesn't need them in the scene. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, also, prior to this, uh, she's shown listening to music on what appears to be 24th century AirPods. So once again... Uh, not really feeling the vibe from these these earthbound scenes. They don't feel 24th century to me. So she is uh, probing the doctor here for what Picard had talked to her about, and and we'll find that out later in the episode. We go back and meet the Romulan survivor. Um, I believe, I forget what her name was in this episode. It was maybe Marilyn, a, a mon um, I forget exactly what it was. And she, they bring up kind of a, a almost like a Romulan mysticism. Uh, 
mythology behind uh, some things that are going on here. And this woman is kind of almost like a Romulan soothsayer. Uh, some of the stuff kind of fits because if Romulans are an offshoot of Vulcans, Vulcans were really big in mysticism. And so it, it would make sense that Romulans once again would have a lot of um, mystic backgrounds, but yet their mystic backgrounds are sur surrounded in more secrecy and and uh, and and spy nature because that's the nature of the Romulan Romulan race is the duplicity of the Romulans. So this kind of I can buy this, and the scenes kind of make sense. So Kirk, uh, Kirk, uh, Picard does eventually uh, meet up with the um, uh, captain of the ship, and when he beams on board uh, the ship to meet the captain, he first finds his uh, hologram, uh, holographic servants. Seems like the captain Rios here has a whole slew of different holographic servants. Uh, I like this. It's kind of an interesting uh, take. Kind of reminds me of the thing they did on The Flash with uh, Dr. Wells having different uh, uh, variations of the character from different Earths. Well, here we're seeing different variations on Rios from a um, uh, holographic perspective. So we first meet Rios when he's uh, being tended to by the holographic doctor for a chunk of uh, iron that lodged in his shoulder. We don't really find out why, although uh, it could be the uh, outcome of, uh, of a battle or something. Picard uh, does say that he smells Starfleet over Rios, who is an ex-Starfleet officer, because of the way his ship is maintained and just the way that Rios holds himself. He says, I smell Starfleet all over you. This is a good scene. Uh, Patrick Stewart is excellent in the scene, and I really like so far Captain Rios. He's he's probably one of the best uh, characters on this new show so far. Back on uh, Earth, we get uh, Raffi investigating where Bruce Maddox, who is the creative Dodge and Soji, would be, and finds out he's on this. Uh, planet called Free Cloud. We don't know why, we don't know what Free Cloud is, but we found out we find out that's where he is. Back on the ship, we get the holographic uh, doctor talking to Rios. And it's, it's kind of neat that he has all these um, people confiding in him who are basically versions of himself. So we get one last scene uh, between us and Picard before he departs. And this is a nice scene. It kind of calls back into what I've, what I've said, um, that Picard doesn't really feel at home on Earth at his villa. Uh, he really yearns for space. And she spells that out for him, and he, he yearns to be back in the stars. This is almost kind of like the scene we got in the episode The Inner Light where... Picard was uh, trapped on a planet in his own mind and, and living a, a full life without Starfleet and, uh, and but yet still yearning and having memories of Starfleet and yearning for the stars. So I really like this scene. And the scene, unfortunately, does reinforce later on uh, in the next episode. We're going to see that basically uh, Picard is going to have a, uh, a holographic uh, ready room that's a image of this vineyard so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense we'll go over that when we get to episode four why that doesn't make sense because in this episode he's yearning to leave the villa and in the next episode we're seeing him go back to it we'll talk about that later so we go back to the cube and uh the soothsayer and basically what's happening is uh she's found out through using these these romulan uh, almost like card pieces that Soji is a individual named the Destroyer. That there's two sisters, one alive and one dead. The alive one is going to become the Destroyer. We don't know how or why, but she's going to become the Destroyer of the universe, I guess. But, you know, not too much is really spelled out here. Back at the villa before Picard leaves, we get a really bad, and I mean really badly shot and, and executed fight scene. It was almost impossible to, to track what was going on here. 
but once again, the Rhymelins, we, we get a little a one line saying that the Rhymelins have cut the alarm. Uh, that's why they're able to break in here. But I find that Starfleet and Earth is very uh, under secure <laughs> in the 24th century. We get, we get these people able to, to beam down pretty uh, at will. And luckily, after Picard and his, and his buddies take out the, the Romulan forces rather easily, they have weapons hidden around the villa. Uh, one last uh, guard comes into the door and is about getting ready to shoot Picard when uh, the doctor comes in and she has grabbed one of the weapons that the, uh, the uh, Romulan storm guard uh, dropped and, and shoots and kills the, uh, the Romulan. So... Yoris does bring back one of the Romulans, and, and this scene doesn't make a whole lot of sense because Picard thinks just because he's telling these guys that he's going to let them go, that they could just suddenly divulge the whole plan. Of course, this guy doesn't. But after trying to kill Picard, um, you know, why, uh, why would he just spill the beans? Also, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that these Romulans would just, you know, come down, beam down, and uh, go all mercenary on these guys. Why not just, you know, it's been shown they can beam at will. Why not just beam uh, Picard up? Or furthermore, why not just beam a bomb down to destroy the entire compound? You know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What are they trying to accomplish here? The scene really is, is very, uh, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So back in the cube, uh, the Romulan soothsayer grabs one of the weapons from one of the, the guards and is going to destroy uh, the destroyer, uh, Soji, but is uh, incapacitated by Soji. Meanwhile, a little bit later, she's in her quarters speaking to her mother on a hollow um, device basically asking you know how is dodge and, and the image of a mother says dodge is fine nothing's happening here so we we know that this image is false and the image itself uh puts uh soji to sleep almost like it deactivates her so we know there's something going on uh with the mother who may or may not even be real Later, when she awakens, uh, we get Nova coming in again and declaring his love for, for Soji. Really, these two characters are the weakest uh, in the show so far. Uh, their scenes together really haven't added up to a whole lot. After that, the sister of the character, who is finally showing her Romulan ears and eyebrows, uh, comes in to... Uh, find out what's going on with the whole plan and to threaten him unless he d finds out all of Soji's secrets. This is almost like a the Game of Thrones type. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you get almost like an incestuous relationship between these two characters. They're really always uh, within spitting di distance of each other. So once again, not much is divulged here uh, in this plot. Back on the ship, uh, we finally, after th three episodes, after three hours, get into space. And I, you know, if there's one complaint I would, I would have of these first three hours is that the, the pacing has really been snail-like. I, I think these three hours could have been condensed down into a two-hour pilot, at the end of which we would have gotten the scene where Picard gathers his crew and is in space. So Rafi, the doctor, is coming along. Uh, Rafi's character is a lot better once she becomes his almost second in command than she was in the previous scenes in a drug addled and uh, self loathing state. And the very end of the episode, we get where everybody's w waiting for what you see here engage. And of course, Patrick Stewart is fantastic in that scene, and we get the Outside of the ship, we get the swell of the next generation music, and that's it. The episode is is over with. I think Star Trek Picard Episode 3, end of the beginning, is probably the weakest of the th three episodes. Not a lot happens here. The story isn't really advanced all that much. We do meet uh, and, the, and get together with more of the crew, but I, I really think this should have happened earlier. 
maybe after the end of episode two. Uh, there's a fight scene in, in here that really is nonsensical, um, badly filmed. And even all the, all the stuff that's uh, done on Earth with Raffi could have been uh, condensed down and shortened. The beginning of the episode with the flashback is nice, and I'm sure we'll get more flashbacks as the uh, series goes on to how the show got to the point it is at uh, this time. But that's really all I have to say. It was an okay episode. Uh, wasn't the greatest and definitely was probably the weakest of the, uh, of the three so far. So that's Star Trek Picard Episode 3. I hope you liked uh, this review and analysis. And I hope you comment down below on what you thought about the episode. What did you uh, think about my review? And what do, you, what do you think about the three episodes so far? How, do you, how are you liking the series after basically what has been a three-episode pilot? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you really enjoy these videos. And once again, as we always say, keep reading and keep on trekking.